Hi, my name is Keith Cooper, No Flight Images, and uh, in this video I'm going to do a short review of a tilt shift lens. The 24mm PCE 3.5 ED, if I remember the name for it, from Nikon. Now this is uh, one of Nikon's older lenses. It uh, dates from 2007, still current though, and still a very good lens for use, particularly for people like myself. I'm an architectural photographer, architecture, interiors, industrial photography, where a lens like this is very useful. Now, uh, there's gonna be a full written review of this as well, which will have more details, more detailed photos that you can have a look at and more, more technical stuff. But uh, this is just an overview with some examples showing some of the things you could actually do with the lens as well as what I think of it from a quality point of view. It's an F-mount lens. Now that means I'm testing it on a Nikon Z7 and I'm using the FTZ adapter. So that goes from the Nikon F-mount to the Z-mount of the mirrorless here. Now mirrorless cameras are actually rather nice for using with tilt shift lenses. I've produced lots of other stuff connected with tilt shift lenses and, um, and a book which I'll mention later since it's just been published in the US. And things like the focus peaking, um, actually the metering works better. Um, shift and tilt will tend to throw off the metering for traditional DSLRs. Now I've used such lenses with DSLRs for a long while. Just means you work in fully manual mode, you set your aperture, you set your shutter speed and ISO, everything, and work fully manually. Now, this particular lens has an aperture ring on it. So it goes from f3.5. You don't tend to get very wide apertures on lenses like this. Um, goes from f3.5 all the way up to f32. Now, f32 is, is occasionally useful if you're using tilt. But I would say that if you're using a high resolution camera with this, you're going to see the fall off in resolution from diffraction quite quickly. And also shooting F32 is a great way of seeing how much dust you've got on your sensor. And now this has uh, the range here. It also goes up and clicks in place to an L setting. Uh, that's fully auto. And then it's if you want to use any of the auto modes of the camera, um, it works like a more modern lens where you don't need to worry about aperture. Um, I actually quite like using it with the aperture setting here because I can just set it to what I want and know that that's it. There's nothing going to change. I'm working in fully manual mode anyway, so it doesn't really matter that much. In terms of focus, it's a nice solid movement. We're about 120 degrees focus throw and the focus does go slightly past infinity. Now that's useful um, if you're using tilt and is actually uh, part of how you position the plane of focus. Now I've done some other videos about using shift, different types of shift, using tilt. So I won't go into all the details here, but I have got some examples. Um, this photograph here was taken using uh, shift, vertical shift, um, and the main reason that you use it for things like this in landscapes as well, because it works with trees as well as buildings, is that it keeps the verticals dead straight. Now, you do have to be a bit careful with your composition. Um, and if you go to the 19mm, which I've also, which is Nikon's widest lens and a, a newer design than this one. Now, the 19mm is very impressive. Nice wide angle. I've got a review of that as well. But um, 24mm. If I use it as it is with no adjustments, it's a 24mm lens. It's a good quality 24mm lens. Um, sharpness peaks probably 5.6 although since you're going to be using shift with it you're using more of the corners and therefore you're more likely to want to take that to say f8 f10 f11 as i say going much beyond that you tend to get a fall off but i'll show that in some examples here uh, the lens um, let's say fits on the adapter here standard mount no problem in using it at all. It just works as a normal lens um, and it works very well. I do like, I've had, um, if you know my other work, you'll know that I use Canon lenses for my professional work. Uh, that's purely because of the range of uh, lenses that they have in this particular type. 
Um, I don't have any favour between any particular brand on it. And in using the Z7 here, I've actually enjoyed using it. It's a nice camera to use. So it's nice high resolution, great camera. But it's not a camera review, it's about the lens. But anyway, let's switch to some examples. Here's a shot taken just around the corner from the previous one. And it shows, once again, the typical use vertical rise with the lens. Now, the lens itself can rotate its axis of movement. So as I've got it here, I can have vertical rise of the lens, fall of the lens like that. Now, for convenience, I call all types of movement of this sort shift whether it's sideways, upwards, diagonally or whatever. So it's just shift with a direction. If you come from a large format background, you'll have all kinds of other names for it. So uh, I'm just going to call it shift here just for ease of explanation. We have a degree of, so the camera's pointing at about this level. So we have a degree of vertical shift or rise there that just shifts the viewpoint upwards, keeps vert like vertical lines vertical and you just compose normally. Um, these shots, most of these were taken handheld using the level in the camera, which is very effective. Now, I can spot when I look at the images, slight errors in it, but nothing that couldn't be cleaned up quite easily. Um, there's nothing to stop you using tilt shift lenses handheld. Um, yeah, this old thing that you always need a tripod. No, not so. Um, but anyway, what we have a maximum of about I think it's 11 and a half or 12 degrees, uh, 12 millimeters of shift that you can have up or down. So there we go, that's just vertical shift. Another example, moved slightly, changed composition. You can see I've got the camera not quite level in that this lamppost leans ever so slightly. Um, now, if I was doing this for paid work, I'd have be there with a tripod and I would line it up and I would check it. But um, this one is, is perfectly right. And you could fix it in software quite easily. Uh, similar thing to there. Now, this is also shift, but this is a more unusual use of shift. And this is diagonal shift. And this is where, rather than shifting vertically, I've also shifted to the side as well. How do you combine the two movements? Well, there's a little tab on the side here and it allows you to rotate the axis of movement. So now I can shift diagonally that way, or if I move it around a little bit more, I can shift diagonally at 45 degrees. Now the diagonal shift, this is where I'm actually pointing the camera here, and I've shifted up this direction. Now this particular shot, you'll notice maybe some rather serious vignetting in the corner. And this is where I first noticed when I took it out and did these shots that I'd left the lens hood on. The lens hood is fine for small amounts of shift, but if you want to use the lens at full shift, take the lens hood off. Same goes for filters. They will get in the way and you will get vignetting, very strong vignetting, such as on this example here. However, a corrected version of it, take the lens hood off, shoot it properly, and now I'm positioned here, I'm looking here, I've shifted the lens diagonally across here. Now, I've, I've got videos about things like this, about horizontal vertical shift, all the things like this, and um, it's quite a useful technique for offsetting your point of view in a picture, and uh, works rather well. Now, another use, uh, here's a photograph of me just pointing it out and there's a reflection of myself in the window. One of the uses for shift is to offset your viewpoint, um, horizontal shift in this case. Um, if I'm looking straight at that window, I see my reflection right in the middle of it. If, however, I move and shift the lens across, so in this case, move the lens that direction, my reflection has now been offset from the centre. 
Now I've used this sometimes when photographing uh, buildings where I want to change the reflection in the windows but I don't want to change my viewpoint obviously. So I'll move a little bit and then change the viewpoint back with a bit of shift. Now there are various effects uh, that you get when using wide angle lenses. Have a look at the examples for more of this that I've got. Have a look at sideways shift um, and that's Now on to tilt. Tilt in general is something that I use much less than shift, certainly with wide lenses. With longer focal length lenses for macro work, I may use a bit of tilt. For product photography, I may use a bit of tilt. But in this instance, I've simply swung the lens to the side. And so this is uh, also known as swing, moving the front like that and I've moved that across like that. So that lens just bends like that. And that places plane of focus along these line of posts here. It's at f3.5, you're not going to get a really obvious out of focus effect in the out of focus, but it is noticeable and it can be used. Now this is with shift, uh, tilt to the side or swing and I've run the plane there. I can change where the plane of focus moves by changing the focus setting. Now I've covered this as well, examples of it, of how to use it and that, but uh, in this instance, I've also got a little bit of downward shift because if you notice the horizon's quite high on the image. Well, a bit of downward shift, I can combine that with tilt. What about if I wanted to shift the other direction? Well, you can't. Um, with this, uh, with the older lenses like this, you have a fixed relationship between the shift axis and the tilt axis. So it can tilt that way and can shift up and down. You can move the whole lens, but you're still, the two are at 90 degrees to each other. Now, you can modify the lens to put them on the same um, axis. It is useful sometimes. In general, I find with wide lenses like this, I would probably keep it as it is. Um, but I would mention that whereas with the Canon lenses, you can do it yourself by just loosening off some screws and moving it. If you try doing that on one of these Nikon lenses, because of the circuitry that's inside, you will damage the lens um, and uh, it's not going to be an ex a cheap repair. One of these will set you back, I think, currently about 1700 quid new and used, you can find them around about the thousand mark. Um, they hold the value well. Um, very good lenses, a lot of people use them. But the nice thing with tilt shift lenses is a lot of people get them, never actually take the time to understand how to use them, realize they've not used them much and get rid of them after a year. So there's always worth looking for used examples of lenses like this. Um, I, some of my first ones were used lenses that I got um, and they're absolutely fine. I'm still using them later, 15 years on, and they work a treat. But anyway, that's tilt. Um, tilt's more difficult to explain. Have a look at some of the videos where I look into details of doing it if you're interested in that. And obviously I'll have more details in the review as well. Here I'm using shift, vertical shift, and this is a pair of photos. Uh, just reset the tilt, and there is a slight locking here. There is, I would should mention, there is a, an aperture preview button if the camera is running. You can uh, or, uh, stop it down by pressing this button on the uh, lens here, but uh, not something I used very much when using the mirrorless camera. But anyway, we've got that. I can take one photograph with the lens shifted up, one photograph with the lens shifted down, and a simple flat stitch in Photoshop or whatever you choose to use gives me combined image there. Um, there are no stitching errors. Um, if you look very carefully, I did spot a slight glitch in a bit of the brickwork here on the stitching, but nobody's ever going to see it. It's only because I know where the join is. You cannot see the join in it. Let's you shoot at about 50% greater resolution. So 50 megapixel camera would give you 70, 80 megapixel for an image like this. So I'm doing it. You can stitch sideways as well. You can stitch up and down. I prefer up and down stitches because you get less parallax errors, potential stitching problems from vertical elements like this. Now, 
shop that I've used for an awful lot of testings at De Montfort University. Um, this is at f3.5. I just take a series of shots at different apertures to see what they're like. And this is where I'm just looking at how sharp the lens is at different apertures. And if I go to f8, apart from the fact that I've moved very slightly, you can see the sky is lighter. And that is not because I've changed the exposure. It's purely because at f3.5, you get quite a bit of vignetting. You also get a bit of softness if you've got much shift. So it's got a little bit of vertical shift. So my eye level is here and I've shifted upwards. I go back to f8, you can see it's a more even sky. Um, quite often the vignetting, if you shoot at say 5.6, a little bit of vignetting just helps lower the brightness of the sky sometimes. So it's not always a bad thing. But as I say looking at these images tells me that I probably get best center performance 5.6, f8, and if I've got much shift, I really want to go to f11. Uh, but it depends what you've got in the corners. If you've got just plain sky, it doesn't matter so much. Here we go, uh, the sun in the shot, and also with the lens hood on. Uh, there is the lens hood showing at full shift here. And uh, we've got a bit of flare. Uh, there are a few elements here, a few little blotches of sunlight, but you'd expect it shooting into direct sun like this. Um, generally, with lenses like this, particularly when shifted, keep the sun off the front element. If you have to take the, fil the uh, hood off, because you're using a lot of shift, make sure it's protected, keep the sun off it, just even if it's just holding your hand like in front, just to shade the front element because that will cut down, does reduce contrast, it just gets you a better shot. But it shows there the very distinct, and this would have been at f8, and you can see the sun spikes there. Chromatic aberration on the lens, it's pretty low. Um, this would be equivalent to about 400% zoom on one of, the, one of the diagonally shifted images earlier. Uh, the top bit shows the chromatic aberration that we're getting, and the bottom example shows just simple application in camera raw of automatically fix chromatic aberration, which works on this. Now, you can't use lens corrections on a lens like this very easily because the EXIF data that's stored with your images has no indication of the amount of shift or tilt. There is no electronic connection between these settings here, mechanical settings, and what the camera knows. The camera knows it's a 24mm lens, it knows which one, and that is it. So any adjustments you might want to make afterwards, you have to make manually. Uh, can be done. Um, I've looked at it elsewhere. Uh, it's not difficult, and it's a fairly low level of distortion on this. I've, se I've seen far worse on lenses. Uh, another aspect of distortion, this shot, there is a ever so slight bowing of the top there. This is, once again, with vertical shift, so it exacerbates the uh, uh, amount of distortion and it's showing just a little bit of barrel distortion. It's very small. Um, it's only if you take a picture like this that you even notice it. Once again, correctable if you absolutely needed to. Now, in looking at other aspects of vignetting, um, I've set the camera up um, on a, a light box, uh, focused to infinity, just to see what the vignetting is actually like. Now, this is a series of shots uh, the bottom line here, this goes from f3.5 to f16. This shows the amount of vignetting. And you'll see there is still some level of vignetting, even as you go to 16. If you go to 22, 32, yes, you see uh, a bit more. You also notice, and this top row here is with full shift. And this is with the lens hood off. This is real vignetting of the lens. Um, as it's soft at the start here, it becomes sharper, sharper, and by the time we're at f11, f16, there is real vignetting just in those little corners. It's something you can deal with. Certainly images from a camera like this can be processed quite well. No problems with that. Uh, you'll not have difficulties there, but that's just something to be careful of. Now, for the next shot, I've posterized this. 
Now the posterization just makes it easier to see the vignetting and the form it takes. And if we look across the bottom line, it's fairly much as you'd expect. Um, it's centered vignettings towards the corners. This will full shift. We see the vignetting at the top that I mentioned earlier, but there is a little bit of vignetting opposite the center. So there shouldn't be as much vignetting along this side of the image as you're seeing there. It shouldn't be there, what's causing it? Well, in the lens itself, because of the relatively narrow aperture here for the lens mount, that full shift, there is quite a bit of physical vignetting of the lens, of the rear element of the lens. Now, I know it's going through an F to Z adapter. That doesn't change anything because, in fact, the Z mount has got a much larger aperture. Uh, and here's the, uh, the actual Z7 itself. You can see it's a huge great lens mount, there's a Z mount. There's nothing to cause any problems there. And it is much smaller, the F, the F mount here. The F mount, here's the adapter, and there's that. And if anything, it makes me look forward to when Nikon bring out a native Z mount version of a tilt shift lens because that's where the benefits of the large mount that the Nikon, uh, Nikon have adapted for their mirrorless, the Z system, uh, that is going to be a real advantage for lenses like this. And you're going to notice it in performance, edge performance. Certainly the vignetting will be largely a thing of the past. Not entirely gone, but it will go to some extent. But uh, anyway, that's a run through of using the lens. Um, it's a nice lens. I enjoyed using it. Thank you, Nikon UK. Um, if you're interested in tilt shift lenses, I've got some other videos. I've got lots of articles on the Northlight website that do it. So I've got things like tilt tables. So uh, this is complex, it covers lots of lenses, but this is how to set tilt. And this is how, in that picture with the line of posts, I knew how much tilt to set just by having a look at a table like this. Actually, just one column of it. You don't need all of it, for example. And if you're really interested in it, um, I'm going to have to do another plug for my book using tilt shift lenses. Um, photography with tilt and shift lenses. And uh, it is, I'm told, now available in the USA. So um, if you want any more, do drop me a line, ask questions, uh, or drop me a line at, at Northlight Images. Uh, hopefully that's been of some help. And uh, next time I'm going to be looking at some more Nikon lenses. Thank you.